Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we'll be delving into more true and terrifying tales. Before we get started, though, if you have a true scary story that you would like to share, go to ravenreadshorror.com forward slash pages forward slash story, and you can submit your story there. You can also check out the shop while you're there. The other shop I have is SpookyLovely.com, which is the apparel and Teespring shop. I'm updating the designs there pretty much all the time, so keep checking it out to see if there's something you might like. As always, links to Patreon and anything you might need, including the other channels and podcasts, are always in the description below. But without further ado, you know what time it is. It's time to get comfortable. Grab a beverage of choice and get ready to take another journey into the night. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story, and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hay field and then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hay field because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line, to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stayed where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of at the time as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of bones, flowers, a bit of dark glass, things like that. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, terrified, frozen still. 
The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in kind of a wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back, and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water, and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, grip like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again with talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and he disappeared. I remember that they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room, and I was happy to go, and happier still that Grandpa didn't yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would throw into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy the man was really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, and I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous, worried that I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, whatever it was, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother, that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time, I didn't go there. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary-aged self. When I did start going back to the crick, I took a bucket of toys and a thick stick plucked from the woodlands on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the crick. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. 
Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble and he was a weirdo and he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort. And when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but I was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, and began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew then or know now, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along, the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard for me to keep up. Eventually, he would stop where he lost me knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of busyness and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at Rhesus. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back lapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left it. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from far out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but not to go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around the opposite side. There, I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep when I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. 
The next day, I went back into the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I would still eat, take in from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like the first time he did on that first meeting. At this point, you might be wondering why I've posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird but Wholesome, I guess. Well, that's because there are two more occasions that I want to tell you about. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. If you're squeamish about animal stuff, this is probably a part you should skip. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked off clean. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. I'll spare you the rest of the details, but the thing struggled and it was horrible to witness. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowering waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and I felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as I was asked. He took me to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless and wrapped around the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at what I now figured was a girl lazily the man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all. 
only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud that it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair into one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity, her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side and then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get into trouble again, not thinking about the girl, the couple, and what might have been intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually, school started. Classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man and the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin. And that through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody, someone too, or if they're known, if their behavior rings any bells, belies any known intention. I figure that wherever this tale goes, maybe somebody will know who they are, and hopefully you won't discount this tale out of hand. Either way, now that I've remembered everything about that time period, I doubt I'll ever forget it again. A former co-worker is back from the dead. This is one of the biggest personal glitches I have ever had. I work in the admitting department of my local hospital. One of the things I do is keep track of obituaries. When someone's obituary appears in the newspaper, I check to see if they still owe the hospital money. If they do, I clip the obit, fill out a form, and then keep track of how their insurance pays and things like that. A few years ago, and I've worked there for over 20 years, one of my coworkers in the dietary department retired and passed away soon after. I know because I processed her obituary. This coworker's daughter was really good friends with my cousin, so the daughter was even over at my cousin's house the day after my coworker's funeral. They had a big wake for her mother and everything. Today, as I'm working ER registration, the daughter comes in and says that her mom is in the ER. I was brought up a little short. I thought, uh, what? I didn't say anything for a moment. So my office mate had to step in for me and look up this lady's mother. Sure as heck, it's the woman who died years ago. My office mate lets the daughter back into the ER to see her mom, 
and I am unable to find the obit form that I filled out. Edit number one. I heard back from my cousin and he's as weirded out as I am. Coworker's daughter has no memory of the wake or anything, but she said she's been getting this stuff from the people around her for the past few days. People remember her mom dying, even funeral details and the like, but the coworker's daughter doesn't remember any of it. Plus, her mom is right there. Really freaky. Edit number two. Spoke with cousin instead of texting him. Coworker's daughter said that it was her dad that died and not her mom. But she also said that's not the way that any of the people who run into her remember it. They're asking where her dad is, how he is today. He's not answering his phone or texts. To her, the man had been dead for over 10 years. Edit number three. I've been asked if I had any close calls or moments where I could have slipped from one universe to another. And yes, there was one. It was a little over two years ago. I was getting my evening medications together, but I was tired and I screwed them up. I ended up taking an entire full bottle of glipizide, which is a medication that lowers your blood sugar. I accidentally took enough to kill a horse. I realized it right as I laid down for a nap due to extreme exhaustion, and I felt really, really weird going to sleep. Looking back on it, maybe I fell asleep forever there and woke up here. Final edit. I've been getting a lot of angry replies about what happened with the glipizide. So this is the full story. I take a lot of medications for a lot of stuff, so I have a lot of empty pill bottles lying around. That day, I had an empty pill bottle with the label still on it. So I figured I would just grab all of my evening med doses out of my bedroom, take them to the dining room, and just swallow them with dinner. I've done it loads of times before. Like I said, I was tired that night. So when I pulled out my bottle of glipizide, I got my dose and then accidentally closed the bottle with my evening meds in it put it back where the bottle of glipizide went, and then took the full bottle of glipizide with me to the dining room. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't look at the bottle when I took my meds that evening. I just threw the pills back and swallowed them with dinner. The pills were tiny, and all I noticed was that they didn't feel quite right in my mouth. I didn't think anything else about it though, because the idea of taking a whole bottle of pills seemed ludicrous to me. I mean, what kind of idiot would do something like that? me, apparently. When I stumbled back to my bedroom, I checked the bottles, because something was very, very wrong. I discovered the rest of what should have been my evening meds in the bottle. I had mistakenly put the glipizide in its place, and that's when I saw that I had downed the full bottle. I wanted to grab my husband and holler and shout, but my body was made of lead. I could only crawl over to my bed and flop on it. And when I woke up, everything was fine. That's what I mean by going to sleep there and waking up here. I don't think that I woke up back in that place, that other dimension. I think I died there and I woke up in this one. I tell that story because that's why I think that perhaps, just maybe, that person did die in the other universe, but not in this one. In any case, it's freaked me out ever since. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45 minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. 
A sign taped to the metal read, Closed. Absolutely no access to hot springs. Fines $2,000 max, or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle, June 20th, 1866. No way! A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and, oddly, respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly, but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud but peaceful, though ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling, as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our sight. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true, and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, 
I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the diamond battle. And maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. One night a long time ago in the mid 80s, I was riding around my hometown at about 10 p.m. with three other friends. Berkeley County, South Carolina was really country back in the day, so driving around at night on dirt roads is one of the things kids did to have some fun. The place we were driving to was called the Gravel Hill Light. It was down a long dirt road in the middle of the Francis Marion National Forest. There were no street lights of any kind and no houses for miles. Up until that point, I had seen the light a few times and even to this day, nobody knows what it is. I know it's so bright that it's almost like a welder's torch, but about a hundred times bigger. There's no sound at all and it disappears as soon as it appears. Anyway, this night we were on our way to see the light. We would usually park our car where the dirt road divides into another road, and after 10 or 15 minutes, the light would appear. We were driving and we hadn't even made it halfway yet to the place where the road divides, when we saw in the distance a red glowing light with fog and the outline of a body standing way down in the middle of the road. We had to drive slow, like 25 miles an hour because of all the potholes in the road. We were curious and we all said, what's that at the same time? Then the glow turned off for about two seconds and came back on. This time, there were three to four figures standing in front of the red glow and this time they seemed to be about 50 feet closer to us than before. They were in contorted positions, but not moving at all. The light went off again, and two seconds later, it came on. Again, they were much closer to us, and this time there were about 10 figures silhouetted against this light, all standing in weird positions. I began screaming, Turn the car around, now, I mean now. Everybody in the car quickly agreed to turn around and get out of there, which is exactly what we did. Back then, I always thought of the figure standing there as ghosts, but nowadays, I'm thinking more alien than ghosts. At 18 years old in the 80s, it just never occurred to me that it could have been alien, but now, it makes so much more sense. My friends and I really haven't talked about this since it happened. This is a true story of events that have taken place in my home. My brother-in-law tragically took his life in the barn of our family farm. Without going into detail, his death has caused a lot of friction, anger, and sadness for the family he left behind, with a big point of contention being his widow. She decided to have him cremated, but never laid his ashes to rest or had any memorial for him. Needless to say, my husband, the decedent's brother, has had many sleepless nights over this loss, including disturbing waking dreams. This tragedy took place in early March of 2020, and by late March, I began hearing and seeing some strange things. One early evening, while watching TV in our first floor family room, while my husband was upstairs and my mother-in-law was next door in her in-law apartment, I heard something that sounded like three faint knocks on the glass door that leads to our mudroom. I got up to see who was there, because it's common for other family members, such as my sister-in-law and her kids who live farther down on our farm, to come by unannounced. There was no one there. 
I thought it was strange and I went upstairs to tell my husband that somebody stopped by, but they must have left before I answered the door. I thought about it a few times while I sat back down to watch TV, but I just dismissed the knocks. A few weeks later, my husband woke me up in the middle of the night, not knowingly, but by talking in his sleep and knocking on our headboard three times really loudly. As time has passed and I'm trying to recall what he said, the exact words escaped me, but he said something about his brother. It was almost as though he was talking to him. I lightly shook my husband to wake him up and to tell him what he had just done. He didn't believe me or remember doing or saying anything. As I tried to go back to sleep, the three knocks stood out to me because I had heard three knocks that one evening. Only a few nights later, I was feeling a little sick and I decided to sleep in our guest bedroom downstairs so I wouldn't get my husband sick. With the virus going on and everything, I didn't want to take a chance. I usually fall asleep early, so I was asleep by 9.30 or 10 p.m. Around 11.30, something woke me up, and when I opened my eyes, I noticed something shining on the wall, a reflection from somewhere. I kept trying to focus my eyes, because sometimes the light from outside comes into that guest bedroom, and I wanted to understand what was making the reflection. I got up and opened the bedroom door a bit more. It was ajar already, and I saw a flickering coming from the dining room. I was startled and I got a bit scared at first, but I decided to go into the dining room to check it out. Two slim white candlesticks sit on our mantle on either side of the Picasso that hangs above the fireplace. One of those candles was on and flickering. This had never happened before, and I started to think that maybe this was a sign from my brother-in-law. My husband was still awake, so I went upstairs and told him what I had seen. He was interested to hear the story, thought about it for a second, but then just dismissed it. I did not go back to sleep downstairs that night. I slept in our own bed, sickness and all, because I was a little frightened. I told my mother-in-law the next day what had happened, and out of the blue, she recalled that a few days ago, she got a knock on her door around 3 a.m. She got up and opened the door because, as I said, it's not uncommon for one of the family members on our farm to do something like that, although 3 a.m. would have been uncommon, but still, no one was there. She didn't even think to tell anybody about it, but when I mentioned the knocking before, it gave her a bit of a chill. We talked for a bit about what the significance of three knocks could be. I said, three brothers, my husband, his middle brother, and the oldest, who was the one that was deceased. My brother-in-law also had three children. Days and weeks passed and nothing happened. Until one evening, down that hallway to the guest bedroom, the overhead light turned on by itself. I saw it turn on from my seat in the family room. This time, I didn't bother to tell my husband right away because he hadn't seemed to care much about these strange things that were happening. I got up and I turned the light off. Because I was thinking that it was my brother-in-law, I was no longer scared, but frustrated a bit because I didn't know why he would be doing these things for me to see when I wasn't even really related to him or all that close to him even though he lived right next door. The next night, I was getting ready for bed in the bathroom down that hallway and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a flickering. It was about 11.30 p.m. That same candle was flickering again. I went upstairs and woke up my husband to tell him. I took a video of it when I saw it this time and I showed him the video. He came downstairs to see for himself. He thought it was strange, but he didn't want to talk about it, and he went back to bed. Nothing happened again for a while, probably a month or two. Then, one afternoon when my husband and I were watching TV together in the family room, he said, Hun, the hallway light just turned on by itself. 
I said, see, I told you this stuff was happening. After that day, my husband began to think that his brother could be trying to contact us. He called his other brother and told him all of the strange things that had been happening. That brother dismissed everything and tried to talk my husband out of believing that it was their brother. My husband still believed it despite what his middle brother had said. I saw the hallway light turn on again by itself a few evenings later. I saw the candle flickering a few more times, one night around 8.30 p.m. and the other times around 11 or midnight. Over the past year, my husband woke up three times having these strange waking dreams of talking to his brother loudly in his sleep. Once, my husband sounded like he was having a full conversation with his deceased brother about his nephew passing his driving test. I recall that he said, he's going to fail? And you know what? The next day, our nephew did surprisingly fail his driver's test. The last occasion I heard a knocking on was January of last year. It sounded like it was coming from the laundry room, which is near that glass door where it all started. But this time, it was only one knock. In February of last year, I started to think that having the ashes and doing something to honor my husband's brother was a must to stop my husband from crying most days and everyone feeling overall terrible about the situation. My husband, his mom, and his brother all needed closure, as did I. I spoke with the family member who had control over the ashes, and she was not agreeable to giving some to me to make a necklace with. You can make these necklaces with a tiny vessel for ashes. I wanted to do it for my husband's birthday. I was devastated. But, to our surprise and comfort, two days before my husband's birthday, he was presented with a beautiful engraved vessel on a chain containing a tiny amount of the ashes to wear as a necklace. It wasn't a gravestone or funeral service, but we were all really relieved and happy to honor him and put some of the hard feelings to rest. I still wondered why I was the one who saw or heard most of these things, but I do feel sometimes that I'm a bit of an empath. I react so strongly to my feelings of sympathy and empathy for living things to the point where I cry, get physically ill, or can't sleep thinking about these things that bother me that I can't control, like people in pain or animals dying. I also thought about why most of these things were happening downstairs in that hallway and dining room. And then I remembered, the dining room used to be their parents' bedroom and there used to be a different way to enter the staircase to the boys' bedroom upstairs, which was in that hallway area years ago. I think my brother-in-law's spirit was in our house, and in his peaceful spirit naivete, found his energy in places that seemed familiar as a child. His parents' room, the door where he'd come in for milking the cows, or trying to make his way upstairs. I never thought there was any evil or scary intent. I believe my brother-in-law knew some things were left undone, unsaid, and that his family was suffering from the unfair loss of him, and was trying to put our minds at ease. Once we got the bit of his ashes, everything felt much more at peace, and our minds are now at ease. I don't think we'll see or hear anything else, except maybe a little reminder of him from time to time. The hallway light still flickers every now and then. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the twilight zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post my story. Anyway, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at six. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me, super excited, because a guy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out, and he was coming to the party with her. While I was texting her back, 
my younger brother walked into the room and asked if I could drive him to his friend's house, which I agreed to do. Then I went into the bathroom to have a shower and do my makeup. So I got in the shower, but when I went to wash my hair, I realized that my conditioner was finished. I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it all. She had also trashed the bathroom, leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower and tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So as I went to step out, before I could realize it, my foot slipped and I fell neck down onto the edge of my tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head. And I remember that my last thought was, wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in my bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five years or so. And if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. What really weirded me out though, was that the exact same friend who texted me the first time messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the guy she'd had a crush on had asked another girl out and that she was really bummed out about it and didn't want to come to the party. I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream, but I didn't think about it much at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed to the bathroom, feeling like I was losing my freaking mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished just like before, and the grip mat was kicked up. At that point, I went back to lie down in bed and I texted my friends to tell them that I would not be going to the party. I'm pretty sure that I slipped in the shower, died, and then woke up in some alternate dimension. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really don't know how else to explain this series of events. In any case, it's rattled me ever since. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He has tons of old cowboy stories and he would always tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from the nearby farm, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great grandpa was working as a ranch hand and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. Now it's mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902. And though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portnoy River to ice skate. There were eight kids all together, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bear and the Gooch twins. The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker. And if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating, 
when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They had fled toward the sleighs, trying to scramble up the riverbank in their skates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because of the skates and he fell backwards toward the ice. The giant was now crossing the river toward them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure that this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged to its shins, but it slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their relief, it did not chase the sleighs. It just stood there, hollering at the kids and swinging its tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the wild man. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints, almost two feet in length that the group found. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The hunting party followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented any further travel. The creature was never sighted in that area again. The story captivated the small community and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho wild man. That spring, my great grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the little lost river valley farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure that he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. My family has been staying in Cripple Creek, Colorado on vacation. Prior to coming here, we had no idea that there was supposedly paranormal activity. So today my fiance and I decided to take a stroll through town, taking photos and whatnot. We heard this weird static noise that almost sounded like it was coming from a loud radio pretty far away. It would come almost in waves where you would hear it for a couple of seconds and then it would just stop. This continued until we reached the casinos. Fast forward to tonight, we're laying in bed, listening to a video. And I hear what sounds like a scratching noise on the window for the second night in a row. I paused the video and listened for a few minutes. After not hearing anything, I continued the video. About an hour and a half later, I was almost between a sleep and awake state, but I couldn't really fall asleep for whatever reason. Then all of a sudden, I hear a scratch again that instantly woke me up. I sat there and listened. I heard it again. I yelled, hey, loudly, and I ran outside with a flashlight, but I didn't see anything. No person, no signs of somebody trying to get through the screen, nothing. After this happened, I was pretty startled and I am by no means one that believes in the paranormal. But kind of jokingly, I said, what if it was a skinwalker? But later this led me to do some research on the town and apparently it is filled with all things paranormal. 
I've seen several things about the casinos, the jail, but has anyone else experienced anything at one of the homes here? I'm really curious. A few years ago, when my daughter was three, I decided to go back to school and become a nurse. My husband and I were in no way trying for a baby whatsoever. I was on birth control and we were very careful. I walk into her preschool one day to find the director and her teachers telling me congratulations with big smiles on their faces. I used to work as a preschool teacher there, so a lot of these people were close friends of mine. I ask them what they're congratulating me for, and they tell me that my daughter announced to everybody that mommy has a little sister in her tummy. I laughed it off and I told them all that I was sorry to disappoint them, but this just wasn't true. My daughter and I went home and talked about it. I told her mommy didn't have a baby in her tummy, and she just kept pointing at my belly and saying, yes, you do. She was very upset, as though I were lying to her. A few days later, I wake up to somebody touching my belly. My daughter has the bottom of my shirt pulled up with her head resting on my belly while she rubs it gently and says, baby sister, what are you doing hiding in there? It was really sweet and I just assumed that she really wanted a little sister. She had never expressed any interest in having a sibling prior to this and we had never discussed it, but that's just what I assumed. We had the talk again and she got really upset with me. She said, I've seen her before, she's in there. She told me that her sister looks different than us and has blonde hair and blue eyes with little holes in her cheeks, AKA dimples. My daughter, husband and I all have very dark hair, chocolate brown eyes and no dimples. I talk to her about wanting a sibling and tell her that when I finish school, we'll try to give her a little brother or sister. Again, she's yelling, I already have a sister. I was expecting to start my period within the next week like clockwork. I didn't. I took a pregnancy test and just stared at that faint positive result for what felt like forever. I was completely in shock. I was on birth control, so Immediately, I called my doctor and they saw me the next day. It was estimated that I was four weeks and six days pregnant. I gave birth to a blonde haired, blue eyed little girl with the sweetest dimples. This experience has always blown my mind. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago, and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like truth or dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog, and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog, who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all, though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to ten miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. 
We didn't question the sound and went on talking until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly five to 10 miles in the span of five to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal, at least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But. Instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. We were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. had an event transpire last night that is a small paragraph in the story of my haunted house. To understand the story, it helps to understand the history of the property. Before my house was a house, it was a Veterans of Foreign Wars club. To those that are unaware, it was a bar clubhouse for Veterans of Foreign Wars. The house is over 120 years old, and many people have passed through the doors over the decades. It seems likely that many tortured souls spent time there. There were probably soldiers, people that have done horrible things while fighting in our wars. I live in the USA, by the way. 
Some of my elderly neighbors talk to me about my house and its history when I'm out walking my dog. Some of them have even drank there, the real old neighbors. Paranormal experiences are pretty common things in this place, but this one was the most recent, and it happened last night at around 11.30. I was laying in bed with my two cats. They were sleeping together at the end of the bed, and I was watching a movie on my tablet. The lights were on, so darkness did not obscure my vision. Here's where things get interesting. In a split second, both cats jolted themselves awake and began to fix their eyes on the doorway to the bathroom. I stopped my movie and tried to listen and observe. Keep in mind, both cats' eyes are perfectly fixed on the doorway, with gaze fixed on a central point in the middle upper height of the doorway. I found this strange, as there wasn't a sound to be heard. My first thought is that they were tracking a fly or a bug. It's winter and cold right now, and I don't think I've seen a bug in months. That's because no bug was there. My vision is unusually good, and the lights were on, and nothing was there. At least nothing I could see. At this point, I'm really trying to figure out what these two cats are looking at. They began to turn their heads horizontally, as if someone was walking out of the bathroom toward the foot of my bed. While this was happening, their heads and eyes moved in sync with each other, as if the two cats' bodies were attached by gears. I knew it wasn't a fly at this point, for certain. Anyone with a cat knows how a cat will move when trying to hunt a fly. They'll look up, down, and in circles as the fly buzzes across the room. With their vision at the foot of the bed, they started to look up to me, as if someone was walking up toward me. My hair began to rise on the back of my neck. The pins and needles radiated down my spine and into my arms. All of my senses began to hyperfocus. No bug, no buzzing, but something is clearly there. I can sense the presence of someone there, breathing. The air is cold and feels heavy. At or around this time, I realize I'm having a visit from one of the house's many ghosts. I used to be much more afraid of these kinds of occurrences, but now I just kind of accept it. Anyway, wide-eyed, the cats are staring at something right next to me. In perfect synchronization, their eyes slowly moved up, staring directly over my chest where I was laying. I can sense someone standing over me, looking down on me. This freaked me out. Loudly and out of reflex, I yelled, what the F? For no reason and without any input, the Alexa on my table said, do you want to see something paranormal? Please remember, this is still real life. There's no embellishment. There was no reason for my tablet to do this and also it was really loud. Now I'm very spooked. However, I realize that this thing or spirit or whatever is trying to communicate with me. I did not ask for Alexa, nor did I mention any keywords like ghost or haunted or whatever. Also, as an aside, later I tried to see what settings Alexa was on, and I couldn't find that info because Alexa wasn't even on. I always shut off Alexa because she's kind of annoying. I only turn her on whenever I need something. So there's really no reason for Alexa to have been working. In any event, I decided to reply to Alexa, and I said, no thanks. The air in the room lifted, the cat settled back down, and I tried to sleep and got little. Those two cats saw something that I could not. Whatever it was, it walked out of the bathroom, past the foot of my bed, made a 90 degree turn and stood over me, and tried talking to me through my tablet on an Alexa that wasn't even active. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. 
When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front arms or legs close together or touching, just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs. And the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. At my high school, all the seniors went on an annual camping and rafting trip up in Maine. My class only had about 90 kids in it. All the kids got assigned cabins, four to a cabin. The campground was beautiful. It was right on this huge lake at the bottom of a mountain. On the first night that we were there, some of the people who worked there sat around this huge bonfire with us and told us the story of a ghost who haunted the grounds. Apparently, the campground used to belong to a rich family back in the early 1900s, and the daughter of the owner drowned in the river, or something like that, while sneaking around after dark with her lover. They said that if you were in bed and you heard the sound of rushing water, like a river, she was outside waiting to guide you to the river. If you saw her light, you would be entranced and she would walk you to your watery death. The teachers told us that they only told the story to scare the kids from leaving their cabins after bedtime and that it wasn't real. I got paired up with three other girls in my cabin and we stayed up the first night giggling and talking. By the time we finally fell asleep around 3 a.m., I was jolted awake by a loud sound. It sounded like something large, splashing in water. The lake was nowhere near the cabins, by the way. You had to walk like 15 minutes to get to the water, and the river was at least three or four miles away. 
I figured it was a dream or something, so I ignored it. But a few minutes later, it happened again. I looked over and saw that two of the other girls were wide awake, petrified. One of them looked out the small window, but nobody was there. We didn't sleep well that night. None of the other kids heard the noise, except for a group of boys whose cabin was very far from us. They said they heard it at around 1 a.m., right outside their cabin. And when they woke up, there was a bright light shining into their cabin. When they looked out, they could see a light flashing in the dark trees. We all confronted the campground people, but they all said they had nothing to do with it. The teachers did runs every now and then throughout the night to check and make sure the students weren't out of bed or doing things they shouldn't be doing. They said that they didn't see or hear anything. We didn't believe them. And one of the girls in my cabin was so scared that she wanted to go home. She called her mom and everything to come and get her. Keep in mind, this trip cost all of us a lot of money and we had paid for three days. The teachers tried to calm her down and the campground people insisted on staying up with us to see if it happened again. She stayed. The next night, the teachers stayed outside our cabin while the campground people stayed outside the boys' cabin. All of the students were accounted for. One of the teachers continued to walk around and check all the cabins so nobody was out of bed. Nothing happened for a while, so eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up what seemed like minutes later to one of my cabin mates screaming and pointing at the door. I looked over and saw really long, dark, wet hair dangling in front of the window. The teachers came running in, and a few minutes later, so did the campground people. The other girl was sobbing and it woke everybody up. We told them what we saw, but the campground people said that nobody else was staying in the campground, and the teachers confirmed that everybody was accounted for and nobody had wet hair. Nobody slept that night, and for the last night, we all just camped out in the main hall because we were too afraid to sleep in the cabins. I had forgotten about this story until just now. I've always figured that either the teachers or workers there were playing a sick joke, but I guess I'll never know. Our next story was posted to Reddit by a now-deleted user who tells about living in the most haunted town in Australia. Here's the fascinating story. So for context, the town I used to live in has frequently been referred to as the most haunted town in Australia, and I used to work in a bar on the town's main street, with parts of the building being over 100 years old. This bar, according to the stories, had three ghosts that lived in it, mostly in the old upstairs area which was no longer used as a public space and was just storage. None of these ghosts were at all malicious, but staff staying back late to close such as myself would frequently have sightings and encounters. That being said, the only time I was ever remotely unsettled by an encounter was with that of a young boy who, according to the stories, had died in a fire. In this upstairs storage area was an old photograph of this boy, and to put it simply, he moves in the photo. Now, he never moves while someone is watching, but you would look at the photo, look away for a second, and when you looked back, the boy would be in a completely different position. I saw this happen on several occasions, and the only reason I know that it wasn't just a trick or me going crazy is due to several of the bar's staff members having confirmed seeing the same thing. I don't think it's anything bad, just a little boy playing around, but it really used to weird me out. And honestly, it still kind of does.
A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with antlers or horns or something, not clear enough to say for sure but it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies and it told me don't carry their burdens and that my heart was lighter than I believed to keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex toxic friend. They told me that they didn't do that kind of work and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps, the prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas, and I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis, but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. In the summer, my parents rented an Airbnb in Holton, Maine. It was a very old farmhouse, but it was recently renovated. The fields and sunsets were beautiful. I always felt like something was watching me. It wasn't a bad feeling though. We celebrated my birthday there, and that night I had a crazy dream. A woman named Gladys introduced herself to me and told me that this was her home. She told me she loved having my family and I there. She said that she never wanted us to leave. She also said that our birthdays are very close together as well. In the dream, Gladys and I played a board game and talked about so much, her past, her family, things like that. I tried so hard not to Google her name and see what came up until after I left to go home. But my curiosity got the best of me. Turns out there was an old woman named Gladys who lived there and died about a year earlier. Her birthday was August 10th and mine is August 7th. The picture that was in her obituary looked exactly like the woman that I saw in the dream. That's how I know that it was her. This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace. And I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name, and I felt like I knew him. But I also knew that I had never met him in person, and I couldn't place him. 
He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day, and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born, and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90-something, and the dream that I had was also on December 31st. For some background, whenever I took the bus for school, I was pretty much alone on bus rides. I was always on one of those small buses. We didn't have any other kids on there, but the highest amount of kids on the bus was probably around five, including me. I was the only one from my school on that bus. All of the other kids went to the same school, and it wasn't mine. Plus, I've had about four different bus drivers in my time. The one I'm going to talk about lost her husband about a year before, and she was out for a long time. She had just gotten back when this took place. This happened about four or five years ago, and I was still pretty young. For morning rides, we dropped off the other kids, and we were heading to my school. We were the only ones on the road when the bus suddenly stops on the side of the road. I was really confused. I thought maybe the bus had broken down, but being the shy kid that I was, I didn't say anything. I just waited. Then the bus driver opened the door. I started to feel a bit uneasy. We weren't at my school yet, and there was nobody there, so why was she opening it? She stared out the door for like two minutes when I finally said, Are you okay? I asked. Without looking away from the door, she said in such a low voice that it gave me chills, there's a man there. There was no man there. No person at all. She kept staring for a couple of seconds when she finally closed the door and continued driving down the road. She wasn't my bus driver after that year, and I do miss her. She was a very sweet lady. But that moment still freaks me out. I sometimes think that maybe the man she saw was her husband. I don't know who else she would open a school bus door to. I don't know why she would stop the bus in the first place, especially for a stranger. Maybe she saw her husband, and it wasn't until after the door was open that she realized he was dead, and that's why she stared. I don't really know what happened that day, but I'll never forget it. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence and difficulty holding his bowels. They really did a great job and deserved my compliment several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed sometime in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services, and so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission as it just didn't feel right charging it. 
these two individuals had done so much to make his last years comfortable, I just couldn't take that money. About a week later, we held the service, which I officiated. It was well attended and we gave Felix the send off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for the family by the funeral home and cemetery after the service. And we all sat around for a while, just decompressing and taking a well needed break. The wife, Mary, then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. This was during the time where we had physical landlines and attached answering machines. She pressed the play button and the timestamp that the machine read was the identical time as when we had started the graveside service. It was recorded at 11 a.m. sharp. We thought at first it was just somebody who had missed the service calling to wish condolences. When the recording started though, every jaw in the room dropped and an oddness to goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present. Mike, Mary, the daughter, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street whose name I don't know. The background noise was the first thing we heard. It sounded like somebody was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing we could discern. Then, Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. He said, Please, do not follow me. Then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling us during his own funeral service, begging us to please not follow him. The rest of the group talked about what he could have meant. Don't follow him to death? Not possible, they said. Don't follow his life choices? He had made many bad ones during his life. The daughter absolutely believes that he was saying, don't follow me into hell. She believed until her dying day that her father had made contact one last time, telling her to not follow his path and end up where he did once he took that step into the unknown. I always thought that was so strange. 20 years later, and I remember that moment and the stunned silence, shock and fear, just like it happened yesterday. Nobody was comforted. It honestly felt chilling. I still don't know what he meant, but I am 100% certain that the phone call was definitely from Felix and it definitely came from the other side.